Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God and Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near you, your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you, to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. to the latest episode of His Story, and I'm going to co- with my co-host, Lisa Varga. Before we do, Lisa, we were yes. talking that um, His glory and His story will be on multiple channels and uh, mo- multiple TV stations going into May and on radio. So um, we did a deal yes. with uh, Liftable TV. So Liftable TV will be 24-7. Uh, his glory network will be 24-7, so people will be able to get the this history program on uh, 24-7 content, and we're working on two other TV deals, and it's gonna be on radio. We'll be on yes. radio in South Carolina, yep. and then radio through the Americas, 75% of Africa, the Middle East, uh, including Israel, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, uh, Cyprus, Turkey, and Egypt. So this is going mainstream. It is. Uh, his glory is literally all around the world, everywhere where you could possibly imagine. God wants to get his glory and his story out there. So this is very exciting. You guys, it, it's everything just keeps growing and growing, which is great because <laughs> you constantly have one show after another after another. So um, a lot of people are hearing God's word and uh, just getting fed uh, how, how they need to be these days. And it's amazing um, that you guys are across so many different platforms. And so May is going to be huge. You guys yeah. are just yeah. booming. <laughs> and, and that's one thing I want to bring up to the history audience. Uh, we are being approached uh, with our first deal today uh, of people that want to sponsor these programs. So uh, yep. contact us at info at hisglory.me and you can sponsor this. If it's within our core Christian values, yep. um, we will definitely take a look at it. But we, we're working on a deal with Israel to sponsor one of our programs. Very exciting. Very exciting. Yay. We'll, we'll keep doing what we're doing over here. God will do the rest. <laughs> and so what you're doing, you, you know more about this than me. What are you wearing and how can that help the audience? Yes. So this is exciting. So obviously uh, his glory and Amanda Grace, you guys have a really great line of clothing, um, you know, and you have the whole collection. So we thought, hey, we need to do one for his story as well. So what I'm wearing here is uh, it's a sample that um, 
I was sent and they wanted me to see, hey, do you like the quality of it? Do you like the logo? So it's it's a little teaser right now for me and for everybody watching. So it is in production right now with New Dawn Design. And they sent me a little video that I posted and it, you see the printing presses going and it's all made in the USA, which is so exciting. Um, so this is the first sample. And I said, thumbs up, I approve. And it looks great. And we have got such a great collection uh, for both men and women. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is the first item that I'm just kind of putting out there saying more is coming. It's on its way. So very exciting. And as you can see, it says his story, his glory. Um, and that's what this is all about. It's about his glory and his story. And uh, there's lots of other really cute designs, too. We've got some with the logos and then some other really special ones. So I cannot wait to launch um, and uh, put it out there for you guys to to get your merchandise and items that you can wear and uh, share his story and his glory with everyone. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So how would you like to in introduce our incredible guest today? Yes. So we have a really great guest today. Her name is Shannon Dunn Downing. And I'm going to read this because I want to make sure I get everything right because she's got, you know, quite a profile here. Retired professional snowboarder and Olympic medalist. She's an Olympian. Wow. She received a bronze medal in the half pipe event at the 1998 Winter Olympics, uh, becoming the first American woman to win a medal in snowboarding. So that's pretty impressive. And without further ado, let's bring on Shannon. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. So I, lo I love his glory, his story. Love you guys. <laughs> we love you too. Well, we love you too. It was, yeah. it was great to hear that you uh, have been following his glory. What'd you say for a, over a year? Yeah, just right when the pandemic hit, uh, my friend, led me to Amanda Grace, who is on your show often, mm -hmm. and that led me to your show, His Glory. And I just am really thankful for the truth you guys put out. And um, when I saw the His Story, that I really connected with that, of course, you know, with the athletes and entertainers on your show. Amen. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. You're a perfect fit because that's yep. the, the greatest thing that we can do is bring entertainers, athletes, musicians, um, and share their God stories because a lot of, you know, athletes and people out there, it's great. And, and we know their journey and they're amazing at what they do, but what's special about athletes like yourself is that you have a great God story mm -hmm. and he has been with you throughout your whole entire journey. So that's what we love hearing, but we also want to hear, you know, about how did you, you know, how did the whole journey start and along the way what did you go through so we have a lot to talk about today and I am very excited um I have never even skied I have never tried snowboarding because I don't want to make a fool of myself it looks like it's really complicated so I <laughs> I admire you because what you do out there looks really tough and um it's pretty extreme so uh to, let's let's talk a little bit about snowboarding how did you get into that well, um, you know, snowboarding's a relatively new sport and I didn't hear about it until I was 16. So I lived in the suburbs of Chicago. So I'm like the Midwesterner, yeah. um, until I was nine and we'd go to Colorado on ski trips. And then my dad switched careers. He went from the hockey industry, like he owned a few retail businesses and he was like a semi-pro hockey player, hockey coach. Um, so he wanted to transition into a more stable career. So he found um, uh, insurance. He got a, his insurance license, which led him to a new career in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. And so when I was nine, we moved. And um, so going from the suburbs of Chicago, you know, the busy suburbs to the one stoplight in Steamboat Springs, a town of one stoplight, you know, it was like <laughs> this abrupt change in my life. Um, but Eventually, I found snowboarding when I was 16. The ski area first allowed it, and I tried it, and I put my skis away forever, and I just became a snowboarder, which at that time was a, like a totally new sport. I mean, it wasn't allowed at all the ski areas, so um, it was this counterculture sport and um it was kind of like skiers versus snowboarders so it was kind of it was a really fun and crazy time to be a part of that sport and now you know all these years later 
it became an Olympic sport. And now it's like the number one watched uh, Olympic sport on TV, winter Olympic sport on TV is like the half pipe and slip style. Wow. So it's become this crazy big sport, but to be a part of it from the early beginnings has been really really fun, really a great experience. Yeah. You were a pioneer in all of this. I mean, you're, I mean, you, you set the standard for women everywhere. So that's amazing. Yeah. And it was, I was an accidental pioneer, you know, I just grew up in Colorado at the ski area. Um, I tried this new sport. I loved it. And then, you know, my brother, I have an older brother, three years older than me, and he started competing. And then he's like, urging me on like, you got to compete. And I was like, well, I was just shy and not confident at all. So he, he was like my greatest encourager, him and, and my family, but, um, he's like, you got to try it, just do it, go for it. And so I did, I didn't get last. And that was like my (laughs) big achievement. (laughs) I didn't get last. And I was like, you know, if I just give this some effort, I could do a lot better. Um, and so I stuck with competing and I got better and better. And one thing led to the next. And then, um, you know, I, I decided not as, as I was doing better in, in compete in competition. Um, I was also at the time of like right out of high school and having to decide if I was going to college. So, you know, I was like, well, I won't put my, all my eggs in one basket. I'll go to college and just forget about snowboarding. And, um, you know, just literally like, one event led to me um, taking the spring semester off school. And then I, I did really well at international contests. And so that kind of just, I kept, you know, pursuing snowboarding. So, um, and next thing I know, I'm going to the Olympics. So. (laughs) Wow. How, well, how did that happen? So how do you go from what you just talked about to the Olympics? Did you, did you have to do trials or, um, what did you get invited? How did that happen? Because was, this was new in the Olympics, correct? Well, snowboarding, uh, became an Olympic sport in 1998 and that's the first year that I went. And so, you know, when I first started snowboarding, the Olympics was not even a thought. I mean, people didn't even want snowboarding on their mountain. So, um, it just quickly evolved. So, um, and if I, if I backtrack, it's kind of cool because I was really into gymnastics when I was young. Like when I lived in Chicago, I wanted to, my dream was to become an Olympic gymnast or even a figure skater. And so I did ice, ice shows and I, I was, um, you know, in gymnastics and I asked my parents to go to the next level and go to a club gymnastics, um, you know, a team. And right when we switched to like a pretty serious gymnastics, um, club, we moved and I was just devastated. Like, Oh my gosh, like I really (laughs) wanted to go to the Olympics for gymnastics and figure skating, but really gymnastics. And so, and I was just, you know, I'm a pretty short petite person. So my build fits gymnastics and all that. Um, so that was going for me, but then when we moved, forget about it. Um, so then, you know, fast forward with snowboarding, it just grew this exponential rate, like in the nineties. And so, um, you know, suddenly I, what was just fun, I'm just going to do this as just a really fun sport became, uh, there was becoming more money. Um, international events were getting big. Japan was huge in a snowboarding. I mean, people were putting snowboards on their cars for like, to, just to be cool. Even if the, you didn't snowboard, they would, it was just like a frenzy, um, in the nineties and just people were just, you know, companies were just pumping cash into this sport because it was a perfect demographic, you know, a youth demographic. It was exploding as a new sport. It was really, um, like in, in, um, it was, it was affecting like uh, fashion and all yeah. the mainstream magazines were covering it and things like that. And then I think in 96, um, they announced that snowboarding could, was going to be in the Olympics, but then we kind of like, eh, blew it off. Like really, <laughs> I, I doubt it. How could snowboarding ever be in the Olympics? I mean, look at us, look at all these like outcast kids, right? That's like yeah. how people kind of, saw snowboarders and um even though the snowboarders 
it's funny because those outcasts were really smart at marketing and they knew exactly what they were doing. And um, they were like good business people, you know, it's kind of, they understood that this was about marketing and, you know, getting published in the magazines and that's how you're going to grow the sport. That's how you're going to basically receive a paycheck because you mm-hmm. have to, we had to kind of grow the sport. And as a, as a girl, that's another component that I could talk about later, but you know, the girls weren't really getting coverage and stuff like that. So that was an area where, um, you know, I wanted my friends and I to have a job. We wanted to promote for girls. So, um, anyway, so going back to the Olympics, the Olympics were, um, they said, you know, it's going to be an Olympic sport. And then the top, um, Norwegian, he's the top in the sport won every event. And he's, he said, I'm not going, it's way too political. All they want is money, money. Um, the ski industry is now gonna be in charge of snowboarding who the ski industry in the past didn't want to have anything to do with it. So that was like a huge controversy. Now it was like, should snowboarding even be in the Olympics? And if you go, are you even going to be cool anymore? And maybe you should just be outed from the sport, (laughs) you know? Um, and so people don't know that even, uh, Chloe Kim, have you heard heard of gold medal Chloe Kim? Like I went on a trip with her a couple of years ago and I, and I was like, Chloe, like snowboarding, the Olympics, snowboarding in the Olympics was so not cool. Like you were just, it was not even cool. She's like, really? So she didn't even know. (laughs) Wow. Um, so it was just a really funny time. And it was like, well, you're a sellout. The controversy was like, you could be a sellout if you go to the Olympics versus, you know, it's an Olympic sport, like we should go. And so that was really a question in my mind, like, do I go, do I not go? And that was a question in everyone's mind. Um, so why were you considered, why was it like a sellout just because of the, the sponsorships or because snowboarders just wanted to snowboard for fun or, um, I don't understand why they wouldn't embrace being in the Olympics and having this sport get so much yeah. recognition that surprises me. Yeah. So, um, in before the Olympics or um, it, it was really a, just a political thing. Like, so snowboarding had their own federation. It was called the International Snowboard Federation. And the Olympic Committee decided that the, the Federation of International Skiing, FIS, was going to control snowboarding. And so the industry was like, skiing hated us. Skiing tried to like kick us out of all the ski yeah. areas. Now they're, now they want in because of the money or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and so it was more just like, you know, the political kind of thing. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we are going to lose our, what, why we like snowboarding because we like to wear whatever we want. Now you have to have a uniform, you know, figure skaters don't have to have a uniform, but skiers have to have the uniform. And so it's just like this controlling thing to, it, it felt like, um, you know, an oppressive control power over, this really fun and um, just this emerging new sport that it so has. snowboarders are basically the the rebels who don't like any rules. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so rebels now have to wear uniforms and abide by these rules. Wow. <laughs> um, so that was a decision, but you know, I was like, I I'm just gonna go check it out. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you after the fact, like if I think it's lame or not, you know, but I want to be a part of it. And so that, um, previous, well, the trials going back to your original question, um, the trials, we had three events, I think that first Olympics and, um, top, the top four girls went and the top three men went for half pipe and they chose, they could have gone, either way, like four girls, four, three, you know, four and three, either way, girls, guys, but they chose, they thought there was a more, more of a possibility for an extra girl to go win a medal than, um, than a guy at that time. Yeah. So, what yeah. an incredible feeling though, to be representing the United States 
How does that feel when you're standing up on that podium and you're getting your medal? I mean, I, I just can't even imagine like the Olympics or when you've made it there, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like Hollywood, you know, actors that make it in Hollywood, but you know, to make it to the Olympics, you are the best of the best. And I can't imagine what that must have felt like to win that medal. It was amazing. Um, there's so much to that question because, <laughs> and that's why I, I've decided to write a book because I can, I can go through all these stories and, and, and they're kind of funny now that they're over. Um, but it's amazing, you know, to, to be, it's just surreal, like, you know, walking in the opening ceremonies for one and then to win a medal, you know, to get up on the podium and, um, and that, you know, I was disappointed. I got third, um, because I, could have won. And so that, that third place, I just kind of had to like shift my whole mindset yeah, and, and be so excited and really see ahead is like, as a grandma mother someday, like this is what I was thinking, like, I'm going to be <laughs> so excited. It doesn't matter. This experience has been just amazing. And, um, yeah, to be on the podium was just so cool. Mm, and then my I dad, my dad and my brother were in the crowd, you know, waving the American flag and, Oh, it was really awesome. cool. Yeah. But, um, it's I love like, it. you say, Oh, I came in third in the world, like in the world, the I know player world there. And it's probably by like a 10th of a second that's in the Olympics. That's the thing. You know, you've got your gold, your silver, your bronze, but like, what's look at the times. I mean, it's just, it's incredible what some of the people win by. So it's hard when you see, you know, the numbers, I mean, you, you're the best of the best there. So <laughs> that was great. And then, um, you know, to be an American, it took me some time to really understand that as an Olympian, you represent America. And so when we went over there, you know, you get your 76 items of clothing and you get your bags and every, you know, the first morning that we were in Japan, we went to a a breakfast with, you know, all whoever was staying in our hotel. And so they tell you, oh, you have to wear, you know, the certain outfit. Well, my roommate and I are like, these are super, so, such brats. We're like, these are so ugly. These are like the ugliest outfits we've ever seen. We're not wearing these outfits. No. You can't pay me for these outfits. <laughs> so we got. And how old were you at that time? I mean, you're a young kid, and you're that's what you're thinking. You know, now I'm sure you look back and go, oh my gosh, what an honor to wear that outfit <laughs> now. <laughs> so, so just being snowboarders and not conditioned, like yeah. you know, we weren't conditioned to be Olympians someday. We're just like, oh yeah, we qualify, great. Um, mm-hmm. We're hopping on the plane to Japan and going to the Olympics, and so we get we go down to breakfast and in our regular clothes and, you know, our coach is like, you, you have to wear your Olympic outfit. You got, you have to go back and change. And we're like, what? No, really? And she's like, well, you're an American. You're, you represent America. You don't represent, you're not just a snowboarder now. And oh. I'm like, Oh, Oh, okay. <laughs> so, big lesson. Yeah. Big lesson. Yeah. And then it kind of switched our mentality. Like we are, we are here at the Olympics. This is what I grew up watching. Mm-hmm. What an honor. This is amazing. So, yeah. So did it click at that moment? Like we and you're like, Oh wow. This, this light bulb went this on after that. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Now at this time, what what's your faith? Like, were you born and raised, uh, you know, having faith or did something happen through this whole journey where, you know, God stepped in and said, Hey, <laughs> I've got something for you. Forget the Olympics. <laughs> no. So I grew up, um, Catholic going to church on the holidays, you know, just, I mean, maybe typical American, I don't know. Um, but when I was 21, um, you know, I could just see a pattern in my life of like hitting like highs and lows and every low I would call out on God and it would, Mm -hmm. you know, I would see a pattern, like he would help me, my life would be better. And then I'd hit a low and, uh, God. And so, and then I got, you know, I went to college, see you, uh, in Boulder. And I just kind of discovered the new age section of the bookstore and I started Mm -hmm. reading those books and I was like the diligent student you know just like 
oh, I want whatever I wanted. Like I want peace. So I'm going to read, I'm going to read this book. I'm going to get peace because I'm following this, these directions basically. (laughs) And then after a while I was like, these, this is junk. Like this is junk. And I just like my parents were out of town and actually they, they said, Oh, we're going to go to Italy. We're going to St. Francis of Assisi's home. Do you want us to get you anything? And I, and, and I asked them to get me a cross necklace. And, um, so we'll come around to that, why that's relevant. But, um, so when they were out of town, I just had, I spent just days by myself because all I took off school that year. Um, so all my friends were gone in town. So basically I was like by myself going on all day hikes, all day bike rides by myself. And towards like over a week of just solitude, I cracked and I um, just was on my bed in my room. And, you know, there's these shelves with my new agey books and I looked at them and I just started bawling and I just cried out to God, you know, God, I know that you created this world. I knew that of God, like you are the creator. And if you can create these trees in this world that I live in, then you have to talk to me. Like I have to know who you are and you have to talk to me. (laughs) You can, (laughs) and I need to hear you. I need to know who you are. Will you please tell me who you are and speak to me. And then I go, and also, could I please meet my husband? I really just want to meet my husband. I don't want to date anymore. I don't want to, I don't want to mess around with any of guy stuff. I just want to meet my husband. So if it's okay, can I please meet my husband? And so, um, you know, I got through that day and whatever, um, but a month and a half later, I was invited on this trip and, um, and that's where I met Dave and he was just a really sweet guy who offered to carry my groceries when we went shopping. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, gosh, I've never met a snowboard guy that, or any guy that is just so sweet and kind. And so he was a snowboarder too. Yeah. And he, um, both, of us almost didn't go on this trip. Like I was invited and uninvited. And then this, the other girl that was supposed to go on this trip, um, hurt her knee. And so I got reinvited and Dave got invited and he was a new upcoming snowboarder guy that I didn't know. Um, and so when I met him, I was just, um, taken back by how nice he was. And so we just got to know each other and, um, and then started dating. And right away, I was like, this is the guy I'm going to marry. And I called my mom and I just met, this is the guy that I'm going to marry. And, um, and it was, it, he was the guy that I, I'm married to. And have That's kids. great. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, and the cross. So the cross, when I first met him, he, he said, oh, I like your cross necklace. And he was a Christian. Mm -hmm. And so that summer after we met, you know, I said, Dave, can you take me to church? Can you get me a Bible? Like, I just knew that was the right thing. Uh, And then he, he goes, Oh, I think there's a really cool church that, you know, it was like a Calvary chapel. So he grew up more just like the sit down, stand up kind of somber, more church, mm -hmm. a somber church. And this was just, you know, Oh, singing and, but more just Bible based. And so the pastor um, said, you know, anyone in the audience that wants to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, raise your hand and uh, close your eyes. And so I was like, well, that's why we're here, right? Everybody's here. And so I'm think, so I'm like raising my hand and I think everybody in at church is going to be raising their hand because that's why we're here. <laughs> and I peeked out and I was the only one. And I was just like, Oh no. Oh my gosh. I'm so embarrassed. And then I just thought about it and I go, and I, in my heart and I raised my hand back up 
And I just told God, like, I do accept you as my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Like, yes. And I raised my hand and I just felt like the Holy Spirit. And then, uh, you know, it's just been a process of walking out my faith and even, you know, being totally lukewarm um, in the beginning. And, and then how God just showed me like the power of prayer mm. and meeting that led that's a whole nother story, but just basically it was just, you know, I met this just incredible prayer warrior woman who just happened to be at my friend's house and God just speaking to me, prayer, pray, 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 pray. And so, you know, she was talking about her friend that was in the hospital and I was like, well, we should pray because that's all I've been like, God's just really like speaking, pray to me. You need to pray. So let's <laughs> pray for this person. And next thing I know, we're on the floor like for four hours. And sh- it's just this incredible like prayer time. Like we, unbelievable. So that's how I learned the power of prayer. How, why, like God just showed me in such a real way, like the power of prayer and um, and she said, you know, Jesus is saying that you have one foot in the world and one foot out, like lukewarm. And right when she said that, I just bawled. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh, my gosh. Yes, I do. I don't want that. You know, so. So that's sort of the overview of my story, my journey. What a great testimony. That is beautiful. My heart right now is just <laughs> filled with so much love And I'm sure everyone listening, just hearing that, um, you know, everyone that's been there before in that same position and gone through what you've gone through. It's like, I I feel that I know. And, uh, you know, having that courage and I know raising your hand and (laughs) doing the altar call. And but there is so much power in standing up for Jesus and saying, you know what? I'm not afraid. I'm going to raise my hand. I'm going to go up there and I'm going to give my life to you, Jesus. And you did that. And just knowing the power of prayer. I mean, my goodness, you know, it works. It, it, <laughs> you know, it sounds like all your prayers have been answered. And I think what's neat is probably in the snowboarding community, sounds like, you know, people are pretty wild in there and in personalities and attitudes, but for you to be someone that can share your testimony with them and God will use you in those circles because I'm sure there's not a lot of places where those communities can hear about Jesus or, or prayer um, and everything that you just talked about. So I think that's huge. What a beautiful way to have um, the Lord use you to mm-hmm. share your testimony and come here today and talk about that. Um, Pastor, what do you what do you think about all that? I know you know the power of prayer. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, the, the testimony she said when... Um when she said that she re-put her hand up and then she felt the Holy Spirit, that's because the humility came to the heart and he met her in the heart. Mm-hmm. And that's what it's all about. It's, it's a love relationship with, with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I, I got a little teared up on that. <laughs> I know. I'm just listening to it I all and it's it. so beautiful. I just, I love your heart. <laughs> uh, I, it's, uh, I love that the way the Lord showed himself and continues to show himself in my life. And it's so experiential, you know, and, um, that's what I, that's what I hope people get when they meet. I don't know when I hang out with them, it's not, there's so many times, like, I, I don't feel like I, um, it's going to be received to speak the whole, the gospel, Mm-hmm. So yeah, the right it, people will hear whatever it is you say and however it is you say it, um, which you mentioned that you're writing a book. I think that's going to be incredible because it's you sharing all of these stories and more and all the details. And it sounds like you have a lot. Um, are you working on it right now or what does that look like right now? Yeah. Um, yes, I am working on it right now and I finished the first draft. And so I'm going through and editing and um, just... <laughs> This whole project, writing a book, is so beyond me. It's <laughs> really funny. So I don't know if 
if you don't mind, like I'll just explain it because yeah. it's yeah, really hilarious. I think, um, <laughs> you know, just after um, my snowboard career, I, I had two two babies a year and a half apart, and um, and then I I still tried to get back into the snowboard industry and just door after door closed. So I'm like, okay, forget about it. God, do you have a plan? And I'm so sticking to it. And I went through like a whole identity crisis. <laughs> and like, I thought I knew my identity, but obviously God's showing me I really had it mm-hmm. off. I had it off. So, you know, over the years, he's just really had me focus on him and, and just the simplicity of, you know, I'm his daughter. It's, yeah. it's not, a, it's simple. The whole gospel is very simple. Um, so just live that out and focus on my family. And I was a mom who just did that. I put my head down and I love being a mother. Um, and then my kids found out I was actually an Olympian um, when my, my oldest son was in second grade. And he came, they had a scholastic book fair. And one of his best friends said, is this your mom? <laughs> This oh. is your mom, Shannon oh, wow. Dunn Downey. She was an Olympian. And so they came to my, like, I go to the pickup line at their school. I'm in my minivan and <laughs> they run to the car. Mom, you're an Olympian. And that's how they found out I was an Olympian oh. because basically I just, my kids aren't going to care what I did. Yeah, I just want to be a mom. And so it really just, I kind of just put it all away. Like I put my career away, like, forget that. I, that's just not even a part of me. That's kind of like maybe one way I handled it, handled stopping my career, just shove it under the rug. <laughs> Cause I didn't know how else to do it. So anyway, so they, they discovered I was an Olympian at, you know, when they're in second in kindergarten. And that was a, really funny time. You didn't tell, are you famous mom? Like, you didn't know this. How can we <laughs> did, they ever, did they ever ask to take you in for show and tell or your medal in for show and tell? Yeah. Yeah. So I did. <laughs> so I, and that just revealed as Olympian. Now I got to bring my medal to school. It's fine. Yep. Okay. So then, um, see over the years, like I'd go to Bible studies or women's conferences and just be in prayer and feel like I need to write my story. And then people, my friends would say, I really, feel like God's, he wants me to tell you, you need to write your story. And I was like, what story? I don't have a story. Like his story. (laughs) Yeah. But what's his story in my life? And I just, I don't know why it was so hard for me to see, but it took me until right now where I think I have a little bit more time. And actually um, one of my mom's in prayer friends, she, she took me aside and she's like, I really see this picture of you with a book traveling around and I goes like okay okay god you know and and in the past I'd sit down and write on my computer but I hated it I, I'm not a journal journaler um you know the most of the books I read are more like how to's informational because I want to like know how to be a better mom how to study mm-hmm. my bible whatever <laughs> and I you know and so um anyway so when she t- said those words, um, it was just a very prophetic kind of voice that she spoke with, you know, just from the Holy Spirit. And um, I was like, okay, okay, I'm, this is now. And so I just happened upon um, a video with um, this, the founder of School of Kingdom Writers who explained, you know, like I am, you know, using God's called me. this is what he's saying. God's called me to use my expertise and my, um, my, my expertise for God's glory with the school of kingdom writers. And I'm, um, you know, offering a arc year course, a cohort, you can apply. And I was like, that's it. Those are the words God's speaking with me. Like I want to use my experience and my, um, my history for God's glory. And like, I've been praying that like, God, how, how could, what do I do? What do I do? You gave me this amazing life. This is not normal, a normal life, crazy stories, awesome things and the ways that God has touched my life. And I want to share that, but how do I do that? So when I heard him speaking that I was like, I'm going to apply like right away. And I applied 
Um, and I interviewed with him and he said, okay, you know, you're accepted. Here's your contract. This, this is what we're going to go through in one year. You're, you're going to have, you're going to write a novel. And I was like, wait a minute. Why did that did never, that never registered. I thought I was just going to learn how to write better. <laughs> so when I'm writing, the, I'm reading this paper. I was like, how did I not get that memo? <laughs> oh my gosh. Like I can't write. I cannot write. How am I going to write a novel? And then it was like, no, I'm not going down the road of, I can't. God told me I'm doing this and maybe Maybe it's the wrong direction. I don't know, but he's my good shepherd. He's going to pull me back if it's the wrong way. So I'm going to do this. And I was just like, okay, I'm going to write a novel. And I'm just cracking up to myself because <laughs> you don't understand. Like, I don't do this. This would be like somebody asking me to coach them to be in the Olympics in one year or something. So that's how I'm <laughs> it's yeah. like, okay. So you know, I got to um, yeah. I've been doing these devotionals and I want to share this with you because maybe this is the word for you. Yeah. Um, I, I, it just kept coming up over and over again that God doesn't call the qualified. He <laughs> qualifies the called. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that is so like, it keeps coming up, keeps coming up. And now we're talking and I just want to share that because that could be you know. your word. Don't worry about a thing. He has called you to tell <laughs> your story. Doesn't matter if you've written a book. Doesn't matter if you can even write. He will qualify <laughs> you. So That's just right. go with that and you're keep doing what you're doing. That's <laughs> fantastic. I, I, I'm just, I'm so <laughs> proud of you. That's amazing because I've, I've written before and it's not an easy task. And I can see how it could be a little overwhelming, but it's your story to share. It's his story to share. And you are going to help so many people through this. Um, but I just had to share that. So con continue. It's, but <laughs> It is totally for me. And yeah. I, I, yes, I resonate with that 100%. And what, how fun. It's been so fun. I've discovered that I actually do love to write because I've learned to write in a story form. It's, uh, it's not like a, maybe I wouldn't like to write a bi biography, mm -hmm. which I, I would have gone. That's what I was thinking to do. Just, you know, tell my story, yeah. but to show the story is so fun and exciting. So as you know, to write that, it's just been a really awesome experience and what, how God sees us is so awesome because I never ever would see that in myself. Mm -hmm. And it took him to pull that out of me. It took God to see that. And, you know, it's just really cool yeah. and, fun and exciting. So I just adore you. You, you have a kind, gentle spirit sure do. And the way that you're telling your stories. And I think, wow, this was an Olympic athlete, which, you know, you got to get out there and train and, but you just have this, I don't know, but I, you explained it, pastor. You probably see the same thing. <laughs> I, I do. It's just this, this humility, this love, this, uh, yeah. this, this, this feeling it's of beautiful. the Holy spirit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's contagious. Um, <laughs> there. So, I was looking you up because I always, you know, research everybody. So you have shannondundowning.com, uh, but you also have a blog, which is called, is it Live a Life Beyond Imagination? Is that the name of your blog? Because that was within the website, because I want people to learn more about you and see what you're doing. Um, tell us, so that's the website, but is the blog also on there? And is it called Live a Life Beyond Imagination? And if so, what does that mean? Oh, thanks. Um, yes, that's my website. Okay. And it is um, just a kind of like a value statement of what I, yeah, my blog is about and little stories and live a life beyond imagination is to me um, a way to say live outside your comfort zone and just live beyond fear because in so many different ways we can just be, you know, stuck in our own minds and you know, basing situations on our fear and it's uncomfortable to go outside your comfort zone. So whether, you know, e even if you're not like a believer in Jesus, that's really important to not be controlled by fear. Mm -hmm. And, um, but if you're a believer in Christ, like you, we cannot live like that. And especially right now, you know, 
so I, I, I use like little stories and fun things to just kind of ease you into this, but really like it's important. We have to obey God. And when God calls us, it's going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. It's going to be, and if it's not, <laughs> you keep pressing into him because it's, he's going to turn you in a direction that is so uncomfortable and you have to be willing to get out of the comfort zone and just step out. And it's scary. You, you know, fear is natural. We all experience fear. I'm scared to come on this podcast and publicly speak or whatever, but it doesn't matter how I feel. It's just you, one, I want to be obedient to God. I hope that I encourage others to do the same. Um, but just in everyday life, especially right now, it's people are living in fear and it's, you know, you live, God says we are not to, to live by the spirit of fear, right. but of power, of love and of a sound mind. And if you're living by fear, you don't have a sound mind you know, or you're compromised one or all of those love, uh, sound mind and power. So that's not okay. Like we can't live like that. No, (laughs) I don't want to live like that. Um, so I, I, I push myself on purpose to like publicly speak, even though like I've gotten in front of a crowd and I have botched it. I have failed. I've had 2000 high school students in the inner city, Washington, DC, laugh totally laughing at me it wasn't with me and I was like uh fail okay so but when I people doubt laugh, it I doubt it I, it was true and it's a really funny story <laughs> but so, um, okay you have to explain that one because I can't <laughs> like what could they possibly be laughing at and here's the bigger picture <laughs> they might have been laughing because they were young kids like you laughing at wearing the American you know outfit for the <laughs> USA but you know some of those kids went home because so, you have a powerful story, but that I have to hear what were they laughing at? Did you trip they, and fall up the stairs? Or something? Because I, I didn't imagine. tell. I didn't tell my powerful story. I didn't know I had a story. And so after the Olympics in '98, you know, all the Olympians go to the White House, get a tour, and we're in Washington D.C. And so um, one of somebody came up to me and said, "Would you like?" would you be willing to speak at a high school? One of the gold medal hockey player women, you know, the hockey women's hockey was um, in the, in the Olympics for the first time in 98 as well. And they won a gold medal as a team. Wow. It's really exciting. But one of the, I think one of the, the players, um, spoke and so oh you're gonna go along we'll take you on a bus to this high school and she's gonna speak and you're gonna speak but because I had never publicly spoke before I was just assuming that it would be like a question answer because how could I just come up with a like 15 minute speech so Uh, I was just assuming this so I get there and this hockey player player girl just gives like a an amazing story. Like, I mean, I'm in tears, I'm laughing, I'm crying. So inspirational. And I'm standing there next in line and I have no story. I, I don't, I don't have, I had never even thought about my Olympic experience. Wow. I just never, I just didn't think of it. And then I was frozen in total fear. And so nothing was coming to my mind and I couldn't even ask the person like, Hey, can you interview me? Cause I was just like frozen. So, Oh, they call me up. And I just, I don't even know what I'm saying. So I'm just, I start with my, you know, a little bit about how I got to, um, to start snowboarding and then at the Olympics. And then I just started saying like all these quotes, like, cheesy inspirational quotes. If you can dream it, you can do it. And like anything that was coming to my mind. And then they started laughing and then I started laughing and then I just didn't have anything to say. And I was like, you know, I'm kind of like Forrest Gump. And <laughs> I, just like, I just failed. And by the end they're laughing and I'm laughing at myself. And I was just like, get me out of here. This is so embarrassing. So anyway, from that time on, I was like, I, I can't do this. I cannot public speak, but 
when people would ask me, I'm like, yes, I'm going to do it anyway. I yeah. feel like God wants me to do this. I have to do this. So anyway. There's just- another person who was kind of afraid of public speaking. His name was Moses. I'm yeah. not sure if you remember him or not. So God can use anybody. And look at the journey he's taking you on, though. You have to start somewhere. And you had to have that experience to know, okay, well, now I got to step up my game and now I have to prepare something. And that's just the journey he has you on. You are a beautiful speaker. Just hearing, this is the first time we've ever spoken to you. And I just, I want to hear more. I mean, I want this to be like five hours long and I want to read your book. Um, So it's incredible what God is doing through you. Um, But now, you know, just like, you know, as snowboarding and training for the Olympics, you have to train for this. So if you can do the Olympics, this is nothing compared to <laughs> what he's got you on. So I think you're going to be fine. And I think you're a great speaker. So well, you, uh, I God, hope you do a lot more speaking. Yeah, God has to test you with that. Uh, we all yeah. in our walk go through. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier about g- getting outside of our comfort zone. God uses those type of circumstances in our life where we think we failed, but that was him building us in the clay, forming us mm-hmm. to, to do something in that area uh, for his purpose and his glory. So it always starts with a failure. I've had many failures like that. And uh, he's loving. He picks me back up. And you always learn from it. Yeah, you do. And like you said before, you didn't really have this story to tell because you didn't find Jesus until, I mean, you, you did. You grew up, you know, and you were in the Catholic Church, so you knew Jesus and you had faith in your life. But the powerful story that you have didn't come until later and you didn't have it at that time. So, well, and you're going to have even more. <laughs> yeah. So I did like accept the Lord in 94 and the Olympics were 98, but you know, I was like such the baby yeah. Christian, lukewarm, yeah. um, not understanding. So anyway, it's just been a great yeah. process of how God's just continuing to speak to me and just work in my life and work. That's how he works in everybody's life. It's awesome. Yeah. How he works. Yeah. I am so glad you were with us today and just sharing your testimony and your story, uh, his story. Um, and I please keep us informed on when your book comes out, because we will tell everybody about yeah, it. Yes, and uh, I can't wait to read it. <laughs> we want an autographed copy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. I really am honored to be here. I love his story. I love his glory. I love Jesus. Um, I love what you guys are doing. And I'm thankful. Aw, thank you. I just, I, I, I just want to give you a big hug yeah, right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that's truly from the heart. Yeah. So Shannon Dunn Downing, thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, we're going to follow along and share whatever it is you're doing out there because you have got a great story. And thank you for sharing it here yeah. on his story today. Thank you, guys. All right. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you. Well, Lisa, what a great guest that was and is. I did. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, we get to talk to the guests before they come on or yeah. some of them we know personally. Um, but with Shannon, I haven't met her. You haven't met her. And I knew her story and I did a little bit of research. But my gosh, my, my heart is just so touched right now. And uh, like we were saying, her humility, her heart, it's just she's so precious. Yeah, and, incredible. Um, it's just it flows. And yeah. Oh, by the way, I'm an Olympic uh, medalist. Yeah. <laughs> so humble. Uh, and it's funny because she's like, oh, you know, I, I'm not a good speaker or I'm afraid to speak. She's probably one of my favorites so far. It's like, wow. Yeah. So that goes to show everyone listening. It's like if God has done something incredible in your life, share it. It doesn't matter how, how you deliver it. Um, you know, it, it's about sharing his story with the rest of the world because it's going to touch somebody or it's going to touch a lot of people um, and impact their life. And I just, I just think that's so beautiful. And that's why we're here. That's why we do this show to, you know, share incredible things like this. So, and thank you for having this platform. I mean, if it wasn't for everybody loves his glory and that's how they all hear about his story. So um, you guys are doing your job and you're out there doing show after show after show. So we're, we need everybody to pray for you that God <laughs> continues to give you strength and good health to keep up what you're doing. Cause 
you're on you're on a mission, an even bigger mission. Yeah. Anything new going on that we all need to know about? <laughs> yeah, there's there's something new every day. God is God yeah. has got it, and and um, this is going to be a mighty network for His purpose and His glory. It will. Yep. We'll keep showing up. We'll yep. keep telling the stories. There's lots of them out there, which by the way, if anybody watching, um, if you know of an athlete, an actor, an entertainer, a musician that has got a great story and, and you, you're connected with them, have them reach out to us. Where or How would they do that? Who would they reach out to? Or what? Well, if it's somebody that actually has connections uh, to somebody, which just about everybody that follows his glory does. Yeah. <laughs> um, to contact us at info at hisglory.me so that we can get them on his story. Yeah. yeah. There you go. More stories are coming. And I know you're working on a couple, couple, couple good ones. Yeah, we've got some big <coughs> ones coming. You and I know who's next, but yeah. Yeah. we'll announce it later. That's right. It's a secret. <laughs> we might be going into prime time too. We are going into prime time. I should announce that. Um, all these pre-tapings that we're doing uh, that they will be going into prime time, so you'll be seeing his story at eight o'clock going forward. Worldwide. Worldwide. Yeah. Literally worldwide. And uh -huh. the radio. <laughs> radio. We're we're across yeah. every radio. So any any kind of wave that's out there, we're on it. <laughs> yeah, it's funny you bring up any wave because we are actually working on ham radio. Oh wow! Which you think is the, one of the oldest technologies out there, but that is a certain way you can get audiences that don't have the the, the well about whereabouts to get the message of Christ to. Oh, that's great! Yep. So it's, See, I learned something new. Every TV, day too. radio, ham, whatever way we can preach the gospel from east to west to north to south, yep. to get good stories for His glory, like like today. Amen. It's amazing. Amen. All right. Until next week. Yes. And a new clothing line that's coming. Yes, new clothing line is coming. Uh, well, and you guys have lots of great clothing too already. So I have to keep up with you guys. So we got the, we got the His Story collection coming soon. Um, so check for that. I'll, yeah. I'll wear something new each week. So it'll be fun. All right. We'll get you some gear too. Gosh. You may, I don't think you want the ladies zip up hoodie. We'll get you something a little more, you know. And I don't think I'm going to do the ladies uh, tank top. Uh, with no, love no not that one either. <laughs> However, you you've got uh, a new workout program coming up. Oh yes, so I do. Work up here. Yep, my doctor's got. All, he's getting a hold of me tomorrow. <laughs> yep, so. we will be praying for you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, God all right. bless you. God bless. Until next week. Because of COVID-19, the air we breathe and the things we touch are no longer safe. Shared air and surfaces harbor risks due to COVID and other pathogens. But with active pure technology, air and surfaces can be purified and disinfected quickly and safely while you share and occupy spaces with others. Active Pure is a patented advanced active form of PCO technology. It works by creating and propelling safe and powerful disinfecting molecules into the air in a room, which quickly seek and destroy pathogens everywhere. Active Pure molecules work by piercing the shell of a virus or bacteria to destroy its living environment, thereby preventing it from replicating or doing harm. Active Pure technology is designed to use the law of gases to carry its safe disinfecting molecules into every nook and cranny in every shared space. The law of gases is the reason that the smell of microwaved popcorn immediately spreads through your entire home. These odorless and invisible Active Pure molecules fly through the air from our portable or installed Active Pure products quickly and safely destroying pathogens in the air and on surfaces. Active Pure is very different from other technologies that take a passive approach and require that the pathogen be pulled into an inefficient filter, UV light, or plain PCO mechanism. Active Pure does not wait to see if by luck the pathogen is captured. It seeks and destroys them quickly, wherever they may be, in the air you breathe or on the surfaces you touch. Active Pure can deliver measurable and guaranteed results, 
giving you the peace of mind to know that you are providing the best protection for the people you care for. Active Pure technology is used in hospitals, state houses, and other shared facilities across the world. It is proven by science and validated by multiple third parties. Active Pure is not too good to be true. Obey's extreme terpenes incorporate all the vital components of the industrial hemp plant by sourcing organic ingredients from the flowers, seeds, and stalks of these God-given plants. All of our products meet or exceed the 2018 U.S. Farm Bill requirements. Obey is leading the way in restoring past remedies for essential solutions with clean and simple, natural, organic, healthy choices. Thank you for your support as it helps fund many of the His Glory Ministries Benevolence Projects.